So hello to everyone. I'm happy to welcome all of you to our 17th seminar in the webinar series on precision physics and fundamental symmetries. My name is Klaus Blaum from the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Professor Mariana Sabranova from the University of Delaware in the US. Let me quickly introduce her. Mariana is well known for her theoretical studies in the fields of fundamental symmetries, trapped atoms for atomic clocks and quantum information, as well as atomic properties for precision physics. Mariana has published more than 200 scientific articles with a focus exactly on the topic of our webinar series. In addition, she is a chair of the annual workshops of the American Physical Society on precision measurements. So we are really extremely happy that she agreed to give today the lecture. To the audience, as usual, in case you have questions, please type them into the chat room or the question and answer box. We will address them at the end of the talk to the speaker and there is enough and plenty of time to answer all your questions. Mariana, we are looking forward to your presentation on search for new physics with atoms and molecules. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for the invitation and for the nice introduction and for organizing this wonderful seminar. Today we'll speak about search for new physics with atoms and molecules. Oh, sorry. And I will start with a time 100 years ago. The year was 1920. And we thought we knew everything about the universe. And it's quite remarkable because that was before the quantum mechanics. That was uh, before really our completely modern physics and the standard model. And even at that time, people knew, of course, that there were many things which they didn't understand. For example, the spectra of atoms. And nevertheless, somehow that could have been swept under the rug. And people thought that all which is left is more precision. And today we came 100 years. And again, we think that we understand pretty much very well our universe. Here our standard model. And now we have our particles and we have our interactions. And again, it's really easy to think that we know everything there is to know about physics. However, there is, of course, a big problem with the standard model. For example, if the standard model were true, our universe will not exist because there is a glaring disp um, a difference between the matter and antimatter in our universe. Technically, we should have matter and antimatter. And of course, as we know, if we get exactly the same amount of matter and antimatter, all you end up with is light. And glaringly, somehow we exist. And therefore, somehow there was a disbalance between the matter and antimatter particles produced. And we are pretty sure the antimatter galaxies are probably not hiding anywhere. So all searches for primordial antimatter uh, have um, not discovered any. So this is one of the really biggest issues with the standard model. We just don't have uh, a good explanation for the matter antimatter asymmetry in the standard model. We need much more violation of fundamental symmetries than standard model produces. And then of course we have this big elephant in the room that we don't know what universe is actually made of. Our beautiful standard model, which just so beautifully describes our terrestrial experiments, unfortunately only, or fortunately, accounts to only 5% of the universe composition. And uh, the rest of it, we label nicely as a dark matter and dark energy, uh, pretty much just to show we're pretty sure those are two different things, but we don't know what eyes of them are. And I will speak a little bit about the searches for dark matter today. And then of course, as uh, uh, many of us uh, compared with experiments, and of course we compare between different experiments, we almost forget just how many assumptions we make when we compare different experiments. For example, we assume Lorentz invariance. We assume that the clock which operates in Jilla will operate the same way as a clock which operates in Ricken. And uh, we assume, of course, if we rotate our experiment or remove it with constant velocity, that nothing changes. And this is one of the foundation of modern physics. 
And then we assume positional invariance. We assume that if you take your measurements in June or in January, that shouldn't make a difference where the Earth is going around the sun. And we assume weak equivalence principle. We assume that fundamental constants, which you can get from this database or from the textbook, are actually constant. And then we, of course, assume our standard model. As we have discussed, we already know that this is definitely highly incomplete. And uh, now we find that constants are actually probably not constant in most of the model beyond the, st uh, beyond the standard model, which I show. And then in quantum gravity model, rents and variance go out of the window. And the uh, positional variance and weak equivalence principle also will not be conserved in many beyond the standard model theories or actually even some of the dark matter scenarios. And therefore, it's really very interesting to see how we can search beyond the standard model with precision instruments. And the reason why we can do it now uh, for these atoms and ions, there's been extraordinary progress in cooling, trapping, and controlling of quantum systems. And in this case, this allows extraordinary new ideas of how to actually look for violation of all of those symmetries and postulates, and also how to search for the dark matter and dark energy. Our goal is, of course, is discover new physics. And uh, a few years ago, it occurred to us that the search of atomic molecular optical new physics searches really have greatly expanded. So we have put together a review, which is, of course, you know, already lacks many new experiments which came in the past two years. Search for new physics with atoms and molecules. And uh, we made an effort of actually putting together a comprehensive review of uh, what happened in the century past 10 years and what we think is going to happen in the next 10 years. This has 1,100 or more references and uh, 10 chapters. So very briefly, I just want to outline, following the title of my talk, of the scope of the effort in uh, searches for new physics with atoms and molecules. So first, uh, we actually started with the uh, search for variation of fundamental constants. And this can be done with atomic clocks, spectroscopy, astrophysical studies, molecular frequency measurements. There is really a great many systems in which you can actually look for variation of fundamental constants. And now also with atom deformers. Then, of course, there is a precision test of QED, which have been done for a long time, but now the precision have extraordinarily increased. And there are many new experiments with, uh, for example, highly charged ions as well, and with lighter systems, and with uh, muonic hydrogen. Atomic purity violation has been around for quite some time, but precision now hopefully will also improve with new terbium experiments. And uh, EDM experiments and related time reversal violation experiments have really a great chance to find new physics in the near future. Test of the CPT theorem, you already heard talks uh, about many of those topics in this workshop. Uh, look for differences between matter and antimatter. For example, comparisons of protons and antiprotons, comparisons of hydrogen with antihydrogen, which reach extraordinary precision. For a short while, actually, uh, the antiproton magnetic moment was more accurate than the proton one. So uh, then there are, of course, many searches related to the dark matter. When you search for various exotic interactions, for example, spin-independent interactions or now spin-dependent interactions. And uh, there are many different experiments which allow you to actually do searches for those exotic uh, interactions. With inclusion now recently of those precision as to shift measurement, looking for nonlinearity of the King's plot. There are great many searches for the light dark matter, including the uh, microwave cavity spin precession experiment, uh, radio axial searches, atomic clock, accelerometer, spectroscopy, exotic uh, also four searches due to, which are generated by those uh, dark matter particles, magnetometers, clock networks for detection of transient signal. This area essentially exploded in the past 10 years with many new experiments. <coughs> General relativity and gravitation can be tested with atom interferometry. 
And it's possible now that uh, atom interferometry could be precise enough to actually detect gravitational wave. waves with a new prototype, MADGES 100, being built in Fermilab. There are Lorentz symmetry tests and searches for violation of quantum statistics. So the range of searches have been extraordinary, and there is very much progress which have been reported in this workshop and will be reported in future talks. And uh, I just would like wanted to give you a breadth of those searches, but now I will talk about new physics searches with atomic clocks and in the end show some of the very recent progress in atomic theory. So what is a clock? Well, most of you actually, or all of you, have used atomic clocks already. If you ever actually use the GPS networks, you use the microwave clocks on those satellites. But those clocks, even though they are sufficiently precise to give us position to about a couple of meters, those are actually so old these are not even in this graph. So the clocks in the GPS are accurate to about 0.1 nanoseconds. So they are not even in this plot for the microwave clocks. And the progress in optical clocks have been tremendous. In fact, you pretty much see the more slow for the clocks. And uh, I will discuss a little bit in the end of the talk of how far do we think we can actually progress with the current clocks. Just to put things in perspective, the clocks at 10 to the minus 18 level of precision will not lose one second in 30 billion years, more than the lifetime of the universe. So what do you actually need to be the clock, uh, build a clock? You probably have heard the talk by Eckhart Pike, so I will just be brief here. So what do you need? You need a system with predictive behavior. So you need something which cycles at constant frequency. For example, if uh, all you need to use a clock for is to make sure that you harvest or uh, plant your potatoes or grain or other things properly, but the Earth going around the sun, that's actually a very good clock for those purposes. Of course, you want a GPS and you need something which cycles at higher frequency. You need to be able to count the cycles to produce time interval, very easy with Earth rotating around the sun, not so easy for optical frequencies when none of those uh, electronic counters actually will work. And then you need to, of course, to agree on the origin of time. And in this case, the atoms are superb for the clocks because atoms are perfect oscillators. Atoms by nature are all the same, and in the same environment, they will oscillate at exactly the same frequency. So it's your perfect oscillator. So you take a sample of atoms, or you just take one, for example, all trapped ion clocks. So now work with a single ion, as you have heard maybe uh, last talk on the torbium plus ion. You build a laser, which is in resonance with this atomic frequency. And for now, this actually places one of the strangest requirements of what atomic transitions you can actually use for the clock. You really need to be able to build a tabletop laser to do the excitation. You need to be able to build uh, super stable laser. And in this case, that was actually right now defines what kind of transitions you can use because so far, most of the transitions were with invisible infrared or near um, uh, UV range. So with now frequency comes being extended to uh, much further range, much deeper into uh, VUV, it's going to be a hope that we can actually be able to use the transitions a wider range of transitions for the clock. And then we need to count the cycle of the signal. An atomic clock works very much as a tuning of musical instrument to write tone. So you start with the approximate wavelength, which you know, and then you move, you just tune your laser until your atoms are in resonance with the transition. So what you actually measure, you measure the population. For the Ramsey scheme, for example, you do power over two pulse, you wait some time, and then you do another power over two pulse, and then you measure the population and see whether the atoms actually in state one or in state two. And then uh, you repeat those measurements over and over, you adjust your frequency, and eventually you'll be able to actually measure this entire curve and find out what your central frequency is. At this point, you lock your frequency, um, you lock your laser, and make a measurement to see actually the frequency with the frequency comp. Of course, now one of the issues is that the standard of time is defined by cesium. 
And therefore, you cannot actually do any absolute frequency measurement better than a cesium clock, which uh, ultimate precision is about 10 to the minus 16. However, the frequency counts allow you to compare it to optical clocks already at 10 to the minus 18 range and actually will allow you to actually do much uh, better comparisons when precision of the clocks will improve. So it'd be very interesting to see in a few years whether we'll actually a switch of standard eventually to a different uh, <clears throat> atom from cesium, but this is quite some time still probably away. And this is uh, how the clock looks like. And in, uh, incidentally, if you have your uh, quantum computer with, uh, for example, neutral atoms, but for time, it uh, looks probably about the same. And uh, there are many applications of the clock. I already talked about definition of the second and the GPS and the space probes. But also, if you've seen the beautiful picture of the black hole, you need the clocks to synchronize telescopes for very long baseline interferometry. Also, the clocks will be capable actually of measuring the, relative, measuring the geode of Earth to extreme precision. So we'll twist the geodesy with clocks will actually allow measurements in almost real time of differences in heights between two points. Just to put things in the perspective, the precision of 10 to the minus 18 is a one centimeter in height. If you take your optical table and move it one centimeter up with this clock, you will see the difference in frequency, which was done at least uh, at the level 10 to the minus 17, when the two clocks differed by about 10 to the minus 17 and one was about one foot higher. Also, as a sensor can measure heights, it's a gravity sensor. Uh, it, uh, simple estimate shows that you can probably detect magma chamber fill out with about one cubic kilometer of uh, magma, but this is of course still all in the future. Uh, with the clocks with uh, neutral atoms, now have a, a thousand or a few thousand atoms, and there is a first 3D clock at Jiller. And there, the atoms are completely in quantum degeneracy. So this is an extraordinary tool for quantum simulation as well, in both 1D and 3D. And then, of course, the topic of today's talk would be the clock searches for physics beyond the standard model, is particularly dark matter searches. The reason why clocks are so extraordinary in the regard for the new physics searches, it's the precision to which you can actually measure frequency. As I have mentioned, the fraction precision is now 18 significant figures. So if you have some new physics which actually affect energy levels, not all new physics affect energy levels, but a large fraction of those scenarios will. And then the clock frequency therefore will change. And technically what it will look like, it will look like an unknown systematic effect. And in some clocks, those effects for new physics are stronger than others. So if you actually compare two clocks, one sensitive to new effects, and one not sensitive to new effects, then you can actually detect those unknown effects. With clocks. And there is a now a more expanding range of new physics searches with clocks. The start of all this effort was to look for the fundamental constants, specifically find structure constant alpha is actually constant. And now there have been connection of variation of fundamental constants to dark matter searches. It was demonstrated that the light dark matter can actually source those oscillatory transient changes of fundamental constants, and now those searches can be interpreted or specifically looked for as a dark matter searches. Then you can test the equivalence principle, search for violation of Lorentz invariance. The best test of uh, tensor Lorentz invariance for electrons is actually done with clocks, as you heard from Eckhart Pike. And uh, there have been already proposals to search for the gravitational waves with atomic clocks as well. In many theories beyond a standard model, the fundamental constants are actually not constant. So many of those theories, string theories, any theories with extra dimensions, uh, actually the dark energy theories, many others, anything which involves a very time varying light scalar fields, for example, would actually source the time variation of fundamental constants. And since the frequency of optical transition depends on the fine structure constant alpha, therefore, and some clocks are more sensitive to this effect than others, and measuring the frequencies of two optical clocks will allow you to search for the variation of alpha. Well, you want to keep doing it for a while. 
and uh, how much is a while? Well, some of those actually data now uh, encompass 15 years. For example, the rubidium cesium data are now available for 15 years. And uh, for the optical clock comparison, there have been six months comparison with turbine plus clocks. Of course, how do you know whether your clock was sensitive to the variation of alpha or not? Well, the very easy thing, of course, the more optimistic your system is, the larger this uh, sensitivity would be. So the lighter systems, such as aluminum plus, for example, or even strontium, uh, essentially have a very small sensitivity to the variation of fundamental constants. But nevertheless, with Herbium plus has a sensitivity of about six, in part because you actually have an unusual case of a hole in the F shell. And this is the highest sensitivity which you can get with the already currently operating clocks. And it's actually pretty easy to calculate. It's remarkable that out of all things we have calculated for all the different properties, it turns out to be that sensitivity to variation of alpha, it's the easiest one. It's essentially independent on all the correlation corrections and the easy direct fault calculation generally already give good results. All you have to do, go into your code, tweak alpha a little bit, and then tweak alpha to the opposite sign, and then just look at uh, the slope of the data, and you can get this factor Q, how your energy of the level depends on alpha, and then calculate the enhancement factor, which is dimensionless sensitivity. What do you want? You want the difference of those two factors for two different clocks to be as high as possible. Because if you can measure the frequency ratio, which we already can do, the 10 to the minus 18, if your factor is 100, then the test of alpha variation get two orders of magnitude for free. So it's easier to measure large effects, and of course you have less effects of the environment affecting your experiments. Unfortunately, in the current clocks, the most we can get is six, but I will show that in the highly charged ion clocks, and of course with nuclear clocks, uh, you can get actually much higher factors. So what do you want to do? You want to compare it to the clocks. Still, uh, out of all the published results, uh, the single comparison of uh, mercury plus and aluminum plus gives the highest accuracy for the alpha variation. You get some better accuracy if you actually put all of the world data together. And uh, the mercury plus sensitivity is about minus three, and aluminum plus is used as a reference here. And uh, of course, uh, doing these experiments now with the torbium should improve those data by about a factor of 10. The, one of the most interesting recent, of course, uh, discoveries is that the dark matter can also cause variation of fundamental constants. So how would that work? For the dark matter to affect clocks, you need something which affects energy levels. And an interesting question is what type of the dark matter, what kind of dark matter candidates can you detect if you can actually measure changes in atomic or nuclear frequency to say being even more optimistic to 20 significant figures? First, I would like to very, very briefly talk about why do we think there is dark matter in the first place. Uh, you may have heard about rotation curves. You may have heard about bullet cluster. Here is a picture of gravitational lensing. But some of the most uh, extraordinary uh, evidence for the dark matter is the fact that our galaxy just simply would not exist without the dark matter. If you go back in time and look at the cosmic microwave backgrounds, if we look at the over densities, meaning of uh, density fluctuations, at the time of CMV, which was 400,000 years after the Big Bang, at rift shift to about 1100, it is about 10 to the minus 4. And if you propagate this in time, this should scale about linear with the redshift. So if you take 10 to the minus 4 without any dark matter and then scale it linearly with the redshift, you will still not get any galaxy structures by now. So the fact that actually we have the present universe large scale structures and they actually exist right now, it's one of the most um, interesting demonstrations of why we think the dark matter actually should exist. So why search for the dark matter? Well, because it's there. Out of all new physics effects, we actually have abundant experimental proof that it's something to search for. Well, uh, the first question, of course, could our standard model be dark matter? Well, not the photons and uh, not the quarks or gluons or electrons or coupled to plasma. Those decay too quickly. Dark matter has to be either stable or extremely long-lived to actually still exist by now. 
<clears throat> and this would be just too hot to form galaxies. And therefore, we need some new particle, which is going to be our dark matter. And of course, the universe is probably much more interesting than, of course, we know. So it could be many particles. It could be the entire dark standard model out there. Out of landscape of our dark matter masses, this is a very nice picture from Andrew Longs. And uh, where can we search for the dark matter the atomic clocks? First, our range of dark matter, if we don't want dark matter to solve some other problem, we really don't have any idea what the dark matter mass is. If the dark matter is not a composite, if it's a single particle, on this side, our only limit pretty much is a Planck's mass. Well, if you exceed the Planck's mass, your particle becomes a black hole. And from this side, you would like your dark matter to actually be able to bind the smallest dwarf galaxy, which puts you about 10 to minus 22. If your particle is not 100% dark matter, you can just continue to uh, extend this uh, to the left as well. Uh, just to mention that while in this talk, I will talk about the surgeons for ultra light dark matter, anything which actually lies pretty much in this range, then the EDM searches, which you also heard in the seminars, can be interpreted essentially as searches for WIMPs. And the reason being because the EDM experiments look for effects produced by very heavy particles at about WIMP scale, say about 100 GeV or a TeV scale. So it's one interesting and direct way also to search for dark matter. Now, however, we talk about the ultralight. And ultralight, uh, well, I mean, how ultra is ultra light? That's a good question. So for the atomic clocks, the range would be somewhere below 10 to the minus 12 AV. But generally, ultra light dark matter refer to something which is bosonic because the Fermi velocity, sorry, it has to be uh, smaller, not larger. Uh, 10 AV would be higher than our galaxy escape velocity. Therefore, if your dark matter is a Fermi particle, you really can't have it bound by a, uh, in our galaxy if the mass is less than one AV. So it has to be bosonic. Then the dark matter density in this case, if you, we know what the dark matter density in our galaxy should be, and we find that under somewhere about one AV, we have actually more than one dark matter particle per degree of volume. And at the level, of course, uh, of atomic clocks, we actually have a very, very high occupancy numbers per degree of volume. For all purposes, the scalar dark matter would exhibit coherence and behave like a wave in this case. And uh, if we look for uh, what we call a dilatonic coupling, we actually very simply just multiply our dark matter uh, wave function by our, excuse me, our dark matter wave by our standard model Lagrangian. How will that affect clocks? And that would be a inter very interesting proposal in 2015 that the dark matter then will couple to the electromagnetic interaction and the normal matter. If you're dealing with optical clocks, you only have a coupling to electromagnetic interaction. Then, because of this coupling, it will make fundamental coupling constants such as alpha and mass ratio oscillate. Atomic energy will oscillate. Therefore, the clock frequency will oscillate. Therefore, you can detect such oscillations by monitoring those clock ratios over time. Oh, by the way, that's what exactly what we've been doing already for the past 15 years. And in this case, first, you can just take all the experiments and reanalyze it. But because of the frequency of the measurements, you're essentially looking at a, a very low mass range in this case. Because if you would like to look at the fast oscillations, then you need to actually have new DDT experiments. As I have mentioned, all you need to do to couple now your scalar dark matter to your Lagrangian is just take your cosine wave and multiply it by the electromagnetic tensor. And in this case, therefore, you essentially have an extra term for your alpha. So you have alpha standard model plus this extra term. But you see, if this is oscillating, therefore, this extra term will oscillate. Therefore, the clock frequency will oscillate. And of course, a good question is which frequency will, will it oscillate? Well, the answer is we don't know. And the reason why we actually don't know, it's because we don't know what the mass is. So if the mass in the range about minus 15 EV, then your oscillation of dark matter is about one per second. And one per second, it's a very good thing for the clocks to look for because that's approximately how long your Ramsey wave time, uh, wave time can be now. 
with uh, the best available lasers a few seconds. If you have a mass which is much lower at the lowest range, then we talk about one oscillation per 11 days. If you now talk about the fast oscillations, it's about 10 to the minus nine that actually that becomes very fast uh, close to detect, but you can actually look those with other spectroscopy methods. So what you do, you measure the clock frequency ratios, and then you plot the coupling versus the mass, because we don't know either one of them, so all of those searches will end up as parameter plots, since we don't know either the coupling to the photons or the dark matter mass. So what is your ideal protocol now for the dark matter measurement? Let's say now you have clocks with zero dead time, and this can be established, can, can be actually accomplished by having, for example, two clocks with about 50% dead time operating with, just operate them both, and uh, with interleaving operations. And that's already been demonstrated. And then you just keep in me make measurements. For example, you have a one second uh, uh, measurements, and then you just keep measuring for as long as you're within dark matter coherence, or within multiple coherence volume, as long as you actually have time. And now, detection signal would be a peak with a monochromatic frequency of your dark matter, which is slightly uh, somewhat asymmetric, when you take your time sequence and do a Fourier transform. So if you do the Fourier transform, you go from time domain to frequency domain, and that's, uh, you'll have a signal, of course, in addition to your other possible noise, noises in your system, which you have to understand. The important part that for every type of the clock comparison, which will be sensitive, you should keep peak at the same frequency of the dark matter. You should get at least one dark matter oscillation during your entire measurement time, and you should get no more than one dark matter oscillation unless you actually use extra white pulses as a dynamic decoupling sequence, which was in a, a recent uh, demonstration by a group of Yoruya Zeri. If you actually would like to use Fourier transform, you need at least four to five measurements for the single oscillations in order to be able to actually extract the frequency from the Fourier transform. And that places the limits on uh, the masses for which you can actually detect dark matter with clocks. Here are the current limits, and of course you may have seen already a few of the new experiments which will uh, lie below those. Those are not new experiments, so they're reanalysis of the previous <coughs> rubidium cesium data 2016 and the dysprosium data uh, from dysprosium alpha variation done in 2015, and the black is uh, microscope mission. So our goal here is to extend this graph a few orders of magnitude down and a few orders of magnitude to the right. And it's possible to actually extend by many, many, many orders of magnitude right now, just because of increased precision, increased sensitivity, and also dedicated experiments with the measurement protocol described. How do we actually improve? Let's say now we done those experiments with the most accurate current clocks. So where do we go from here? First, of course, we can improve current clocks. We can achieve better stability and uncertainty. For example, with ions, there are already experiments ongoing how to do experiments with ion chains, with large ion cone crystals. For stability of neutral atoms, there is already a three-dimensional clock operations. There is enormous work and the measurements beyond the quantum limit. And I think the practical applications are very much close to the horizon. And then, of course, it'd be interesting to see if you, what you can actually achieve with entangled ions with clocks. And all of those new things will either already happening or happen shortly. So the question is, how far down this rabbit hole will go? And that varies depending pretty much whom you talk to. It's, there doesn't seem to be any fundamental limit why we cannot actually improve it by a few orders of magnitude. One of the technical questions, of course, is the environment that you're already at a one centimeter difference. And it'll be very, very interesting to see, of course, what precisions you will reach. But there is no doubt that one order of magnitude would actually be achieved probably fairly soon. So how do you actually improve laboratory searches for dark matter? Of course, we can improve all the current clocks. With the current clocks, as I mentioned, the best, stability, uh, the best uh, sensitivity to dark matter is six. It's also possible to use cavity comparison, cavity clock comparison would give you sensitivity of about one for the light clocks as well. So those are excellent new experiments which are already ongoing. 
But the interesting part is what new clocks can we develop with a much higher sensitivity, for example, 100,000 or even 10,000. And we already heard talk by Eka Pike, uh, I think a few days ago, on a nuclear clock. And the nuclear clock potentially has sensitivity 10 to the 4. And we're going to be talked by Peter Firo from GPMFC workshop, uh, actually next Monday, also specifically for the nuclear clocks. I will not talk about the nuclear clock today. And you already heard the talk by Pete Schmidt uh, about the first demonstration of the quantum logic spectroscopy is highly charged signs, which actually could have a fac factors of sensitivity of about 100. And he also gives a talk on Monday. And then I want to show just a few of our very recent results. Uh, for example, when we start talking about which specific dark matter you can detect with clocks, one interesting possibility is a relaxion. And what the relaxion does, it's a very attractive scenario which addresses a gauge hierarchy problem, program, uh, problem without anything, uh, any heavy particles. And um, in this case, you have a relaxion, which could be a light spin zero field, which then dynamically relaxes the Higgs mass with respect to natural large value. And there is a recent uh, archive paper which actually shows that if you have a nuclear clock with about 10 to the minus 19 precision, then you can actually touch the <coughs> relaxion uh, natural parameter space. And there's going to be a talk by Gillette, uh, even though I'm not sure if he's going to talk on this topic, <coughs> uh, also on Monday. And then I would like to talk a little bit about the theory progress. There's been very much progress in theory, prediction properties of highly charged ions. And this is very important because one of the problems with the clocks with highly charged ions is that there is actually a very, <clears throat> very, very little experimental data on those. There is a very specific reason why there are no experimental data for clocks which are actually used for the highly charged ions. Because to get an optical transition in a highly charged ion between different electronic structure levels, what you need, you need the order of levels to switch between one ion and the next ion as electronic sequence. And therefore, those are very difficult to identify because you have a very large constellations between those <coughs> theoretical numbers for the energy levels to get us the transition wavelengths. And also because the identification now is different from one ion to another, there, therefore the experiments which measured very many spectra of the highly charged ions stopped many years ago, just short of the highly charged ion useful for the development of atomic clocks. So for most of the highly charged ions which have been proposed for the clock searches, there are no experimental data of any kind, not even the energy levels. And those are very hard to predict. So for a few years, we've been developing a program uh, of how to actually predict the properties of highly charged ions with good precision. And there is uh, one of the <coughs> Uh, new results. This is not the highly charged ion for clock, but nevertheless, this is an ion on which it was very interesting to actually practice our new priority codes. This is iron 16 plus. So it only has a 10 electrons. So the interesting task which we face here is to see whether we can actually correlate 10 electrons completely. And the puzzle here is that there are ratios of oscillator strengths of two transitions. And uh, this is transitions between J1 and J0 uh, <clears throat> levels. And uh, for the longest time, the ratios of those two oscillator strengths did not agree between theory experiments and astrophysical observations. And that's the first time we essentially were able to run this computation into the ground. We really end up with a case we have no idea what else we can include. We have a very large basis for CI calculation. We have triple, quadruple excitations. We have actually a full correlation of 10 electrons. We have bright, we have QED. We have literally for the first time, we have no other effect to include in this level of accuracy. So we have about 1% prediction. Our problem here, which we still don't have an answer for, that is still not agreeing with experiments. So experiment in this new work is much more precise and the theory is much more precise. There are three different experimental analyses. There are three different, completely different theory calculations. All theory agrees with each other. All experiment agrees with each other. They just don't agree between theory and experiment. So this puzzle remains. The paper will actually appear shortly. And they're going to be talks also by uh, Julian Jose Damon next week, even though they actually may be also on the new measurements in Presidium 9+. 
but that's the first time ever that we really were able to include all correlation effects we wanted to include for such um, system on the CI. And then now much more complicated question, now we're switching from 10 electrons to 60 electrons, but doing the same thing. We are actually trying to do the full correlation of the 60 electrons. So we actually will have all self openers for the very first time with new parallel code, we were able to do it. We're able to actually open shell by shell by shell and see how the correlation of in, actually inner electrons affect the iridium 17 plus. And the iridium 17 plus is a very attractive clock proposal because there are two different clock transitions. And uh, unfortunately, it's very, very, very hard for theory. This is an open F shell. There are uh, levels with F12, F13, and F14 configurations. And uh, not only the clock transition have not been seen, the any of the E1 transitions have not been seen, even though they technically should have been within the range of the uh, experimental accuracy. And this work explains why they haven't been seen, because all the estimates with the FEC code, which essentially correlate just uh, uh, a few of the outer electron, uh, two outer electron shells, predicted that they're going to be seen about 100 inverse centimeter, uh, inverse seconds. Unfortunately, they actually one or below inverse uh, one inverse second, and this is well below the possible sensitivity. We actually looked at all of the one transitions and we found quite a few which should be actually detectable in the near future. So hopefully there'll be a new progress and will be talked by our student and name of about this. And then uh, we also looked at uh, cases when we can use our most high precision codes. There are very high sensitivity to the variation of alpha for the California 15 plus and 17 plus. And before you say, oh, but that's radioactive. Well, I mean, not so much. It's uh, 800 years half-life. And after all, we only need a single line. Even though, of course, uh, uh, there are going to be uh, very interesting uh, technical issues with using it, but it's technically possible to use it for the clock. And uh, those are also one of some of the best schemes because between comparison of the 15 plus and the 17 plus, your sensitivity to alpha is about 110. And in this case, you have E2 clock transitions, which are in visible range, uh, very uh, reasonable uh, lifetimes. Here is um, about a thousand second lifetime. Here is a few seconds lifetime. And uh, this new work on the archive has a full assessment of all the systematic effects for those cases. And then I would like, uh, in conclusion, to talk about our completely new project. This is in collaboration with computer scientists. Wouldn't it be nice that you just say computer calculate? For example, polarizability of the California 15 plus, at, um, whatever it is. And uh, we decided that in many cases, we can actually completely automate the atomic calculations. So what we are creating right now, we are creating an online portal, which will have atomic data codes and the computation. And I'll have a talk on demo specifically on this topic. And how is this going to work? Well, we decided that we can classify the atomic computation by the difficulty level. Let's say a group one, alkalis or alkaline earth ions or alkaline earth um, neutral atoms. Let's say one, two, or three valence electrons. Those we can automate completely, and for one electron, this is done. So for uh, the first version of the portal, which is going to be online very soon, we'll have data for those 12 elements, all alkalis, all alkaline earths. Those we can automate completely. Literally, I can essentially push a button and get a, a nice table and LaTeX of several hundred mat transition matrix elements. And this has already been done. Uh, the next stage is to do it for two, three valence electrons and to make it all available on the portal. So what we can do, we can actually uh, would like in the future to be able to people just go to the portal and select the property which they want to calculate. If the, it's not on the portal for those systems, you'll have wave functions pre-stored and those can be calculated on the fly. Then group two, uh, and those are computation which require expert knowledge, three, four, five electrons or some special cases, more electrons. In this case, only calculation of wave functions require expert knowledge. So if you store those, then again, the computation of other properties can be done quickly. And then group three, of course, is all things which I just showed, 
uh, cases when we have exponential scaling of the difficulties, number of valence electrons. And those actually we have uh, new projects with running on a very large number of processors to actually have a very efficient Fermi code. And we actually hope that eventually we should be able to calculate the most of the Fermi table with those new projects. So a new project is uh, now High Precision Atomic Physics Portal. Email me uh, with atom ion properties you would like us to include. This is a project which is ongoing. But for the future, what we actually would be able to do, I think would be very nice for our community if we actually put together a much larger pro pro uh, project, a centralized source for all the data and computational tool. Imagine if you need some data for your precision measurement experiments that you don't have to search for everything through all the literature, through all the databases. It would be very interesting to actually organize a larger collaboration of quantum sensors for new physical discoveries for all the possible tools which we actually need for those and have a centralized source for develop all those tools for the future. So if you have ideas, then uh, please ask questions or send emails. And I would like to, send, uh, to thank all of our collaborators and point out there are a great many new development coming in the next 10 years. What we need, we need more ideas how to use quantum technologies for new physics searches, for example, can use entanglement as a resource. And uh, also would like to be able to thank all of our collaborators and uh, students and uh, collaborators at the University of Notre Dame, or University of Delaware. Thank you so much for your attention.